Hello, everybody. Once again, welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce. I hope each and every one of you had a very, very Merry Christmas, and I hope that the new year to come is the best yet for all of us. As always, we know that the best is yet to come. So hopefully this year brings in a lot of good fortune, love, and abundance to all of you watching. For today, we're going to be starting on part nine of the Hathor material. We are going to be covering section 2.3 and section 2.4. If this is your first time on this channel, welcome. I'm so happy that you are here. There will be a playlist in the description box called Understanding the Magdalene. In that playlist, you will see all the previous parts of the Hathor material, including our reading of the Sophia Code, Megan Watterson's Mary Magdalene Revealed, as well as our continued reading into the return of the Divine Sophia. You will also find in that playlist the Man Magdalene Manuscript, which was also written and channeled by Tom Kenyon, who channeled this book that we are in right now. So let's go ahead and get started with 2.3, the geometries. For me, this lies on page 133. Let's take a closer look at the three geometric patterns that compromise the interdimensional consciousness training program. As I mentioned earlier, they are one, the infinity sign, two, the atom, and three, the golden octahedron. From the standpoint of the brain-mind re-education, these three geometrics are psycho-neurological tasks. By that, I mean working with the geometries is both a neurological and a mental task that challenges your brain mind in unique ways. And I think I spoke about this a little bit last week. This also is a huge proponent to the traditional yoga practice because in traditional yoga, you are creating a grid of patterns. You are drawing these patterns with your body. And of course, the macro always mimics the micro as the micro always mimics the macro. The two are a mirror reflection of each other. And so the shapes that we're creating in the yoga practice especially are also shapes that lie in the values or pattering of the body. We also again see these shapes outside of us like Uttita Trikonasana or a triangle pose. We see everywhere. We see in the pyramids. And so as above, so below. Our bodies are also geometric experiences full of these pathways. So what he's talking about here is very much a part of, of all these ancient scriptures and ancient practices. As we've learned in this book by the Hathors, and as I've told you many times in my own research, all the religions, all the old spiritual practices, the sacred old religions, all involved exercise. Even in the missing books of the Bible, Yeshua teaches his disciples yoga. This is because as vibration raises in the body, the body has to be fit enough to be able to handle a higher vibration. And no, again, as I keep saying, this does not mean that you have to be an, an Olympic athlete. This just means that you need to be at the best physical health for your body in the here, now moment, whatever that might be. We continue. Research has concluded that every person's brain is highly individualized and unique. Absolutely, because your thoughts, the yoga chitta vritti nirodaha, the thoughts coming from the chittam, the vrittis, the thought pattern coming from the brain, is all an imprinted programming from your karma. If you can learn how to control your own thoughts, then you cannot be controllable. No two brains are exactly alike. The fundamental structures are usually quite similar, but the neural networks are not. They are shaped and continue to be shaped by how each of us develops in utero, grew up, and how each of us responds to our environments. As a result of this uniqueness, each person will respond to the geometries that compromise the training in very individualized ways. Some people will experience an immediate improvement after working with the first geometry, for example, the infinity. Others won't notice a distinct improvement until they have worked with a second pattern, the atom. And still others won't detect change in the brain function and performance until they have worked with the golden octahedron. The point here is that no one can predict how you will be affected by any of these geometries. You have to go through them and stick 
with the training sequence, no matter what shows up or fails to show up in terms of improving the brain function. Yes, you have to trust the process. You have to keep going. That is what is taught in traditional yoga as well. As Guruji often said, this is a whole life practice. It's not one week. It's not 10 years. It's whole life. You have to trust the, the process and continue to work with your own mind through the patterning of your body. This attitude of sticking with the program will be easy for some people and more difficult for others. We live in an instant culture and increasingly expect instant gratification. Absolutely. And that is one of the most dangerous things when coming into spirituality. Um, Gopi Krishna's book, which we might get into later on this channel, speaks about this. You do not want instant enlightenment. You do not want instant kundalini. That is very dangerous. And I left in a comment section once, anybody who tells me that they have had their kundalini awaken, I'm very skeptical of. Because this is a, an experience unlike anything we're used to on our earth plane. And it takes many years. It takes many years of dedicated, uninterrupted practice for something like that to happen. Okay, and usually when it does happen, like for the people that have been documented where it happens, they have a really hard time living in society after that. And I'm not, I'm not talking about those of us who never felt comfortable here on earth, I definitely have never felt comfortable on earth. I know a lot of star seeds had, but that's not what I'm speaking about. A lot of people, including Gopi Krishna, speak about once Kundalini awakens, you can't even eat regular food because everything affects your nervous system. Your nervous system goes into a shock almost. And so this is a very unique cases when this happens for people. And so I'm very skeptical when someone tells me they've had this experience. We also know that the ego can very much get involved. And that's the thing about the yoga or the, any spiritual practice really is trying to keep the ego at bay and not allow the ego to trick us into thinking it's our gut when it's actually our ego telling us this. Okay. And so, um, and I think a lot of people get confused because they want the instant gratification. They think, oh, if I just do this one exercise for a year, I'll get Kundalini awakening. No, no. Ooh, it takes a long time, many lifetimes, many lifetimes. And so we have to be patient. We have to be learn how to be very patient with this process. Our ancestors were obviously very patient with this process because they did not live in a world of instant gratification. And so this is something we have to really recognize within ourselves that we do live in a very on-demand world. And for anything like spirituality, it's not going to come on demand. It takes time. It take, There's a process. Okay. So let me reread that again. We live in an instant culture and increasingly expect instant gratification. But for most people, building new neurological networks in the brain takes time. It takes repetition, absolutely. In other words, you need to do the exercise for an extended period of time if you were going to have any ap appreciative effort effect on your brain function yes and that also goes back to again the traditional yoga practice you know we see in the fake yoga world which would be like vinyasa flow would be like the fake yoga world where the teacher choreographs a different practice every day that's not yoga in the yoga karanta which is the oldest papyrus on yoga it is the same practice for many 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 years before it gets slightly altered that is the ashtanga practice Again, for me as a traditional yoga teacher who is authorized through KPJYI in Mysore, India, I am not choreographing your yoga practice. I am taking your yoga practice from the yoga karanta and you are to repeat the same postures for many, 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 many years, six days a week in order to create this change. So if you're someone that's looking for a different exercise or a different practice every day, just know that that is a hindrance to your spiritual growth. So just something to think about. Just something to think about. While the geometries can produce immediate effects in your brain mind, it may take a while for you to recognize it. Some of us are more sensitive than others, and some of us are more observant than others. In my experience, most people can sense that something profound is happening after they have worked with all th three geometries, at least for a week or so. When we get to actual training sequence, I will discuss the timing of results a little further. But for now, I would like to turn our attention to the Hathor's view, the, the geometry of consciousness. So this brings us to 2.4. Geometry and consciousness, Hathorian view. First of all, before we go any further into this, I suggest you put up your imaginary box by your side. This is that mental filtering device I mentioned at the very beginning of this book. If something I say or convey to you does not make sense or seems too far out, then just toss it in the box. Don't give it a second thought. Maybe it will make sense later. Maybe it will never make sense. 
As I said at the very beginning, it is important for us all to filter anything anyone says through our own sense of logic, our own life experience, and our own values. Don't swallow what anyone says without filtering it through your own sense of righteousness. Assuming that you do, in fact, now have your imaginary box beside you, let's take a look at what the Hathors have told me regarding the effects of geometry on consciousness in general and the effects of interdimensional consciousness training specifically. The Hathors say that geometry compels energy to flow in specific patterns. And when you imagine certain types of geometric patterns, those patterns will create multiple effects. Early on in our discussion, the Hathor said the three geometries that compri comprise the interdimensional consciousness training program do in fact have neurological networks in the brain. And the act of imagining the geometric patterns in detail challenges the brain to create new neurological networks in response to the spatinal demands of those very geometries. In other words, when I was moving in an imaginary point of light through one of the patterns, the complexity of the task would challenge the spatial capacities of my brain. In response to this challenge, my brain would build new neurological networks, and these networks would eventually allow me to recreate the geometries perfectly. Not only this, but the development of these types of neural networks would have a domino effect in my brain improving its general performance and enhancing various abilities such as intelligence and creativity. But they were very clear on this. Not all phenomena that I had experienced could be described through the lens of brain physiology. They contended that the three fundamental geometries generate quantum field effects when they are engaged by human consciousness. We see that with the Emerald Tablets too. Thoth speaks about that as well. They further maintain that the act of moving an imaginary point of light around your head, as in the atom pattern, sets off complex energies that can and do affect both the space around your brain as well as the perception of the space inside your brain. Then likely some of these complex energetics to the phenomenon inside of a particular accelerator. While an imaginary point of light obvious has, obviously has no mass, According to the half R's, this imagined point can still have quantum effects. Whether or not and to what extent these effects take place has to do with the strength and specificity of the imagined point. In other words, the strength of your consciousness affects how strong or how weak the quantum effects will be. According to the Hathars, when you engage the three geometries, they not only strengthen neurological networks in your brain, they also increase the strength or amplitude of your consciousness. This will, in turn, create stronger quantum effects. They further contend that your various subtle energy fields are the means through which you directly perceive other dimensions and realities, especially those dimensions and realities that are outside the realm of your physical senses. According to the Hathars, whenever you work with any of these primary geometries, you affect your energy fields, especially those around your brain, since this is the area where the geometries are focused. The Hathors also insist that the movement of these fundamental geometries can generate micro wormholes, and these tiny vor vortex can and do bring complex energies from other non-local dimensions of consciousness into your energy field and from there into your brain and nervous system. I have noticed in myself that transfers of seemingly non-local energy can sometimes produce astounding shifts in my perceptual and processing abilities.